don't know how I'm going to manage to talk about um, the past year um, in such a short space of time because so much has happened, but I will try. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of background uh, as to how I, I began. So before, over a year ago, um, I was making work back in the UK um, that was really about me drawing and printing lots and lots of repeated shapes and um, sitting in my studio on my own, making work that was loosely inspired on systems and networks that I would just make up and create out of my own head and they would kind of have lots of rules to them which I would devise as I went along and I would just continue to draw them intuitively. And I would be inspired by um, shapes in nature and shapes in architecture and patterns and networks that I saw around me. But they were always very loose um, and they kind of came from, from nowhere. Um, and I would just make kind of a constructed architecture that would hang in space. This is a drawing uh, where I could created a rule for myself uh, by repeating this structure and then I would just let it grow and, and turn into its own thing and, and it, would, it would sit in, in space by itself. Um, so all my work previous to coming here was all very abstract and geometric and it, I, I mean, I love making it and I love the fact that somebody would want it enough to prop, perhaps buy it and hang it on their, their wall in their room or it would sit on a gallery wall, but I always felt like there was so much more potential to do something which related to the real world and I always knew that I could do better and do more. Um, and so when I saw this residency call, I got incredibly excited because it spoke to me instantly about where possibly I could go next if I was fortunate enough to get it. So I applied um, and I applied saying that I didn't know quite what I wanted to do. I didn't come here with a specific plan. I just wanted to respond to a context that was out with my studio and out with myself and that context was water and it was the way it interacted with the city and interacted with nature and, and, and the people um, of the city. And so um, <laughs> they, said, they said yes <laughs> and, and here I, so I came out here um, and uh, embarked on a journey which uh, I never knew how it would be even begin, never, never known how it would end. Um, I didn't know where, I would, where, where exactly I would go, who I would meet and the sort of things I might find out. Um, but I arrived at Ralph Klein Park and within a week of my arrival at the amazing studio out there, uh, the snow fell and I kind of got this <laughs> to look at <laughs> as the landscape and uh, I kind of couldn't work out where, where the water was um, or how I might begin to interact with it or understand it. Um, and this is a view from the studio out, out at Ralph Klein Park. It's this constructed... Um, wetland out in the southeast of Calgary and it cleans the stormwater um, as it heads back into the Bow River and it's constructed of all these cells. But having never made wa water uh, work about anything before, it took me a little while to settle and to look around me and to have lots of interesting, amazing conversations with the staff there um, and begin to work out what on earth I was going to do. Um, I got hold of this image which really kind of started off a chain of thought for me. Um, as Paul said, my work's loosely based on the idea of shapes fitting together. And when I saw this, I began to understand that maybe there was something in here that I could connect to. And so I started to think about how water moves um, through landscape and how you might visualise that. Because whenever we see water, it's either as a living, moving thing that is moving so fast we can't really stop to, to think about it in terms of a solid shape. Um, or we see it as an image like this, which is static and immobile and not as water really is at all. Um, but I started to just do what I always do, which is work from my sketchbook and begin to draw. And by talking to the staff at the RKP, I began to understand how the water fits together and how possibly I might be able to begin describing its movement in terms of its depths, in terms of turbidity, in terms of speed. Um, and one of the most amazing things about the Watershed Plus team is that they always were on hand to introduce me to the right people. I didn't even know who the right people were, but somehow, by asking lots of questions, I would always be guided towards the people that would be able to give me all this information. And not just the information, but the, but the, 
the warmth and the enthusiasm for the project. Um, so, it, so many people gave up their time. You all know how, many, how busy everybody is in this building and how important the work that, they, that everybody does here. Um, but they did give me their time. And one of the first people I was introduced to here was Bert Van Duren. I don't know how many of you know him, but he's an extraordinary character. And um, I really enjoyed talking to him. And you can see him, he got hold of my sketchbook and started doing equations and, um, <laughs> and writing things like opal ch open channel hydraulics. And um, I didn't understand so much of it, but I understood enough to know that this was where I wanted to be. Um, and he introduced me to fluid mechanics and um, the way engineers visualise uh, the flow of, of water. And so I started to research it and I knew, <laughs> looking at these images, that I thought, well, this is definitely it. This is where I want to be because these images are really stunning and beautiful. And they convey so much information about the way lots of different things move in nature um, in terms of their physics, whether it's heat or fluids or gas. Um, they all move in these fascinating ways and I find these really beautiful. I almost just thought, oh, maybe I should just have a, an exhibition of these images and my work is done, because they're amazing. But um, I didn't, and I decided to try um, and create a rule for myself whereby I could explain using what I'd learned, but also using keeping a sense of my own intuition in terms of how I try to interpret beauty and the way things move uh, when you're drawing. And it's always this trying to find this balance between making something that has logical sense in terms of physics or data, but also making something that's a drawing <laughs> still um, and works on, on a level which is a little bit more um, intuitive and, and, and subconscious. So I decided at this point that I wanted to draw the water systems as it came through Calgary, and I wanted to draw just the water and strip all the landscape right away. So you can see I, I was beginning to think about how I might do that uh, in terms of that one in the top right. You can see how might it split between bridge piers, how might it have um, an outfall of water coming into the stream of, of water there and then mix with the, with the general flow. Um, and so I had this, had this fantastic meeting when, I, I again, the, the Watershed Plus team brought all these people together for me and I discussed my work and the kind of drawings I was trying to make to describe water flowing through the city. And you can see there's, there's Frank Frigo there, um, there's Sylvia, there's Vanya from Bonnybrook, uh, Sid from RKP. Again, we uh, got pizza involved, which really helped everybody come and, and, and help talk. It's, uh, that's one thing I've learned from the residency is free pizza makes people come to things. It <laughs> really helps to get your project moving. Um, so that, that was a brilliant uh, meeting and it really, really, on so many levels, it was good for me to know that my drawings were going in the right way. It was good for people to know what I was actually doing here and to understand and to be really interested and give their time. And it made me realise how important conversation was to this whole project and that it wasn't about me sitting on my own in the studio. It was actually, late, much later on, I realised that this, that meeting is actually just as much the work, the finished work for me now as as the drawings that ended up um, being presented to you today. Um, and so when I realised that I was on the right track and I wanted to make a piece of work that described the flow of water through the city, um, I spoke to Twyla and Frank and we settled on this as being a really good place for me to start because there's so much information about this particular part of the city. This is the southeast. You can see Deerfoot Road, Deerfoot, Deerfoot Trail. Trail. Deerfoot Trail, Ogden Road, a couple of railway bridges, another railway bridge here, the Bonnybrook Wastewater Treatment Facility and the Western Irrigation Canal. So there's a lot of stuff going on there and I could describe the flows in lots of different ways. Um, and now Twyla's going to come and say something. So Rachel came to us and said, you know, I need some data. And right away, Parker, I'm like, I have data. Let me show you. <laughs> so, so I come, kind of bombarded her with information. But um, I could see her eyes growing with the possibility of what she could do with this. So it, it was great. Um, so one of these sites, as she said, a really interesting site. You've got lots of bridges, bridges going at different angles across the river. Um, the treatment plant, some of it's underground, some of the water is above ground. So there, it was a great site to really look at the complexity of what was going on. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, I'm not going to take much time, but just briefly explain some of the information that we gave her. 
Uh, the black lines that you see, you see on here, these are cross-section cross locations. So every line that's there, we have gone and we have surveyed the river. So we have seen what the shape looks like on the river there and, and the banks. So we have this information all along the bow, the elbow, Nose Creek, West Nose Creek. So we have a huge amount of data just to describe the shape of the river. And then this looks really coarse, but we take all that information we put it into some computer models. And so this is kind of one of the one of the things that I showed her is we take all this cross-section data, so the black lines relate to those black lines you see here, and the gray is all the bridges. And we, we build this model and we take into account what is the roughness of the channel. Is it gravel? Is, it, is there vegetation in it? Um, that's going to slow flow down. Or is it a, you know, if it's a canal, it's smooth gravel. That's a lot different than a natural channel. So we put a lot of work into these models to really describe what the river looks like. Once we build that, then we can look at all different kinds of scenarios. So you put in what kind of flow rate do you think you'll have. You put that into the model and then we find out where would the water level be. And we can map that out and get a feel for what we can expect. And then these are cross sections. So cutting through the river, what would it look like? So you know, in here it's not only what the water level is, but we can also get a feel for velocities. So where is it going faster? Where is it going slower? And so we started with this very engineering piece of data to, to kind of explain to Rachel, this is all the pieces of the puzzle that we have. And then, you know, here are these maps that we create because of it. And so she went away with all this plethora of data and I think a little overwhelmed. And mm -hmm. we kept telling you, it's okay, like, you, you know, you're, you're doing good. You got, you got the, right, the right stuff. But, but it was really exciting to, as a technical person, to talk to somebody um, non-technical who, who was really getting it. She was talking with Bert, she was talking with all these different people and she was piecing all these things together and was so concerned that she, that she wasn't getting it right but, but she, it was exciting to see that she absolutely was. Um, so but it was an absolute honor to work with her and just to share this information and to see a totally different discipline connect with the river that, that we do. Although we see things in very you know, engineers, graphs, and numbers, um, we can still very much connect to the river, and it was great to see her pulled into that. So I'll let her continue. Thanks. I must have done a really good job of pretending <laughs> I knew what they were talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah, really, yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. Like, I did a lot of saying totally. And um, So one of the first things I did was just those etchings that are over there, actually, just... Um, I translated some of those graphs into what made sense to me as, as again, is this idea of an architecture that sits together properly, and I tried to make it look what, in a, kind of a beautiful thing, but then it was based on the data behind, behind it was all those graphs. It's a horizontally exaggerated cross-section of a particular, one of those bits of the, of the Bow River that you saw earlier. Um, and then I started looking at, again, back to the sketchbook and working out how I might be able to take all the stuff that Twyla um, gave me and create a rule for myself, uh, showing the different depths and how they might be drawn to show the velocity at the deepest part being the furthest part of the one line and then how that might split around something like a bridge pier here. Taking a lot of time to walk around the actual place looking at, um, so walking along the riverbank and seeing physically how the different bridge piers are in different shapes. Um, and then looking at aerial photographs and as, just as much different information as I could get hold of. Um, and so the other thing that I did, or I had to do, was um, wander around the, well, not wander around, I mean, I was, it was a tour. I wasn't just wandering around it, but um, I was, uh, it, this is the way, <laughs> this is a wastewater treatment facility and I, I still can't quite work out why I chose, of all the places I could have ended up, I chose uh, a wastewater treatment facility. Uh, it's not very glamorous but it was a fascinating place to study the different flows of water and to describe, try to work out how you might draw different movements of water and so here you have two different cells doing two different things. One of them is an oh, ara ara anaerobic, no, an a, a bioreactor where you're using oxygen as a chemical reaction to clean the water and it's, so it's bubbling away and then on the other side you have a, a stiller version of, of a different process 
and I just I really enjoyed um, working out how to describe these different flows. Um, and it ended up being something like this, where you have the, the finished drawing shows the Bow River as a more organic uh, shape, and then you have these man-made areas here where you have the different processes. Some of them are circular, the clarifiers, where the water kind of comes up and then slowly moves outwards, where you get the circles. And then the bubbly stuff is, the, is a different process there. But I was only ever drawing the water that you could see up from above ground. Every time it went below the ground, it was in, in within negative space. So there's lots of little gaps here where it goes into buildings and then comes out the other side. Goes down into underground pipes and then ends up as outfalls into the Bow River itself. And you can see the confluence of the river coming uh, there by the bridges, bridge piers, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, and this is just another detail from that original drawing that I made in the spring. Um, and then I got this incredible show at the tr at Truck Gallery in downtown, which I was really delighted to get, because it was a solo show in a really great space, a really great gallery, another uh, artist-run place. It's wonderful stuff. And uh, I, I, because it was the, actually the last show in this space, I was, uh, Randy let me paint on the concrete floor a flow visualisation, <laughs> which was really cool, because I'd never done anything like that before. I'd only ever worked on paper, and suddenly I was draw, uh, painting on, on the floor within a, an architectural space. That was wonderful. Um, th some other work that I made at this time was, um, was these chromatography studies. Um, there were times when um, I got so, well not fed, no, I did so much drawing in lines and lines and lines, and it was all very controlled and precise that these drawings allowed me to free up things a little bit by, I would make one of those drawings with black ink and then dip the drawing into the river water and then allow the water to be drawn up the page and kind of redraw itself. So it's a two-stage drawing. The first I draw and the second the, draw, the water kind of redraws the drawing. And so you get a much more natural and organic flow visualisation um, where the ink is separated as it travels up the page. And I really enjoyed making these because they were so much looser. And then what I would do is I would go back into the paper and emboss where the original lines had been. And there's examples of those uh, on display over there. And this is another little picture of that. And so at this point, I moved to a different studio and I arrived at Telespark, which was an incredible change, completely different environment in every way. And my work did change quite a lot as a result. This is um, the Telespark Science Centre. And my studio, the windows that you see there going across the logo were actually the windows of my studio. Uh, Chris made it especially. <laughs> and uh, it's a bit like, I've said this before, it's a bit like being a Bond villain because you're living in the logo of the building, <laughs> looking down on everyone as, you, as they walk in. I really enjoy being there and kind of spying out at people. It's a really incredible creative space, really busy, really noisy, kids running around having the most amazing time. Um, this was my, uh, on the other side of, so I was on the other side of this wall, and then here is a corridor that kids would walk past, sometimes run past, um, mostly saying my name out loud as they read it, <laughs> which um, was kind of endearing at first, but sometimes, <laughs> especially when, um, the other day, <laughs> the other day, I don't know if I've told you this, Chris. They didn't the, know you were on the other side. No, they didn't know I was on the other side of the wall. So they would read my name out, and the other day, a little boy, I think he was by himself, he just stopped and he said, Rachel Duckhouse. Oh, come on, Duckhouse. <laughs> really embarrassed. And I was, I was sitting right behind. So thanks for that, little boy. Um, and. The brilliant thing about Spark is that because it's so interactive and they're constantly evolving their exhibits and changing them around and adapting to the audience and, and it's, it's very hands-on and the exhibit designers are very keen on uh, prototyping different um, ideas and so because of this attitude they were really happy for me to go down into exhibition space and add things, ask questions, get responses directly which was wonderful and this is one example. Um, so when the flood hit, I was, uh, I was based at Spark by then, and one of the things that Chris did and his team was to set up um, a place where people could just ask questions about the flood. And I, I got a few, 
examples of the stuff. I wrote this on the one of the pages of the sketchbook scans. There's a whole list of the questions that the children, adults, a variety of different people were asking uh, during the flood. But you know, some of these, I just um, some of my favourites were here. So, and you'll see a theme. So they ask things like, why did it flood? How many animals died? Could the flood happen again? What happened to the insects? Where did all the rabbits go? Why didn't you build an ark? Um, did the animals survive? Why did it happen? And my favorite one was, do cars work underwater with their eyes above water? Which is a pretty good question, I think. So just being in that environment of, uh, was a completely different from Ralph Klein Park. And my work kind of definitely reacted and responded to, to this different kind of place. And again, um, through Spark and through, through Chris, I was introduced to one of the professors at the Faculty of Environmental Design. <laughs> and, uh, and she invited me to have a little show there and to do uh, a talk to the students there. Again, a completely different audience from anybody I would have shown work to normally. Um, and so I gave a talk to the master's students there about how I've been um, working with engineers to visualize architecture and how water flows around and through infrastructure in the city. Um, and that was amazing to, to meet a completely different crowd of people in Calgary. I hope you don't mind to put this. I didn't tell you I was putting this up, Chris, but this was another lovely thing that happened. While I was at Spark, I was approached by the Walter Phillips Gallery uh, at the Banff Centre to do a, a workshop in downtown Banff about on the theme of water, because they'd seen the chromatography work that I'd done. Um, and so we, we, Chris and I and Carly from the BAMP Centre spent some time prototyping a workshop uh, which we prototyped in the Spark space um, based on chromatography um, and encouraging the public to think and respond to water and how it flows and moves. And so then Carly and I took it to downtown BAMP and we had a great day where um, all sorts of different people walked past and made some drawings with us. And the theme was, although we never kind of expressly talked about it, the idea was about kind of controlling water but then not being able to control it and it doing its own thing. Um, and that, that went really well. Really enjoyed looking to see what different people cause made. And I think I prefer a lot of the stuff that the kids came up with rather than the stuff I'd done previously because <laughs> they're so much more open to, to testing things out. And then, amazingly, Kind of in exchange for doing that workshop, I spent a, a week in the Banff Print Centre, a printmaking facility, um, and that was really that was really special because it's such an amazing place. And I made a screen print there, um, and this was the screen print. Just trying to remember my order. I can talk a little bit about this because this was um, this was a really different difficult time in a way because the flood had hit Calgary and I had been as in my role as watershed plus artist in residence my kind of job was to respond to issues of the watershed and so of course up until this point I'd, I'd done what I felt was natural to me which was to make visualizations of water flowing then when the flood hit suddenly the water suddenly started flowing in a very different way and people's feelings towards the the water and the way it moves was very very different and I had some very good friends of mine whose basement flat was completely destroyed by the flood. And hearing them talk about it and seeing the photographs of what happened in that space really shook me up and really made me realise that the previous drawings that I'd made where the lines were all fitting together very nicely and it was all flowing in a very organised kind of pattern. When it comes to an event like this, the water holds so much energy and has so much violence in it that the drawings that I'd made previously suddenly seemed just way too neat and organised and gentle. And so it was very difficult to know what to do, <laughs> whether I should even be making drawings like this, because these are, these are people's ha houses and there was a lot of... And I, like I said before, I'd never made work about anything before, let alone something <laughs> like a natural disaster. And so I felt very uncomfortable for a while about how to, how to do this. but. Um, because they were good friends and because the conversation just felt like, it just kind of felt like the right thing to do in the end, I ended up making this. this. Um, and then thinking about how, how you respond to something like that was kind of hard, but um, because I'd already started making flow visualizations, it seemed like the right thing to do at the time. 
So now I get to get all geeky on you and show some graphs, and and all us engineers get a get excited about data um, after all these beautiful <laughs> images. Um, but a couple things I want to comment on. There there are two things that really hit me with some of her initial work. Is number one, I looked at it and it and it reminds me of a uh, the first drawing reminds me of like an artery or a vein in your body, and and I I love that because I think it expresses. Um, how alive rivers are and, and sometimes in an urban environment it's tough because people tend to want to really confine the river and develop close to it and they don't expect a river to change but but the whole essence of rivers is that they do change and they do erosion is natural and normal and that's what our rivers do they do flood and the challenges that we have is when people develop so close to them or interacting with them in a different way um, so so I was really excited when I saw her first round of drawings I'm like yes exactly um, so that was really neat. The other thing I found really interesting with her work is I'd shown her all this technical information. I had talked about flooding. I even showed her the four-inch stack of emergency response plans we have and, and all that talk about flooding. And she, she decided to not show the flooding. She wanted to show how people really saw the river in its natural state, a normal flow rate. And, and, and that's great, but it kind of made me laugh because I'm like, ah, oh, we can't get people to think about a flood because they're, oh, it'll never happen. And so now we've had this event, so now we've got this, this window of opportunity um, to help inform people and make them aware. Uh, at the same time, people have short memories, so we're very conscious of the city. There's so much work going on in recovery, but this is a very special period of time that people are really interested and they're listening. And uh, and we're worried that, that you know how long is that how long is that window going to be open, you know is it going to be a year is it going to be two years it kind of depends what happens in the next few flood seasons so so when she came back and I heard she was going to do some changes to her drawing and add to it with the flooding, um, I thought that was great so oh I think you had one more. Okay. Yeah. So now I got to talk about the flood. Um, so this is a, a map of the rainfall that fell during the flood over the province and uh, zoomed in on the side here. Um, the key thing to note is, is it was definitely southern Alberta, but it really focused on, this is the Elbow River here, this is the Bow River, and then this is the Highwood River, or High River. Um, but the focus of that storm was really on the Elbow River, so it got hit a lot harder. Um, the thing that's a little different about Calgary and how we flood is we are so close to the mountains and it, the mountains are so steep and they don't take a lot of water. There's not a lot of storage. There aren't, there aren't many lakes up there to take some of the water. So when it rains, it comes off fast. Um, when you're looking at response times on the elbow, we have hours. We have 9 to 12 hours from the time we see the river respond in Bright Creek to when we start seeing it here. So when we're talking about emergency response, a lot of the work we have to do, we have to do that before we see the rainfall. The forecasting is key, but it's so difficult on the forecasting. You don't, there's that balance between crying wolf, going out and putting berms in place, getting people excited, and then the storm passes. Also with the mountains, what's really characteristic of Calgary, we can watch these systems come, and they approach the mountains, and then with, with the way the, the atmosphere is above the mountains, it's so easy for it to just go north or south. So, so it's really, really difficult for us. And that's why we spend a lot of effort on our emergency response plans. Um, so for this, the red dot there was about 300 millimeters of rain. So that is roughly about half the precipitation we usually get over a whole year. We got in one to two days. So a huge amount of rain. So, so some graphs, because you know I'm, I'm not complete without talking about graphs, but there's never pink in my graphs, because I was taught as a junior engineer, there's no pink in engineering, so I always take that out. But um, <laughs> I'm starting to work it back in as I'm getting more confident. Uh, so what you see here on the vertical, if I can get my pointer working, is, uh, is a flow rate. So what volume of water per second, and this is time. And each, uh, each break here is about 12 hours. So what we really want to show, or one that I wanted to point out, a huge success story, is this is on the Elbow River. So coming into Glenmore Reservoir, uh, on the top, unfortunately, it doesn't show very well that green line, but this is what the, the level was within Glenmore Reservoir. So the city of Calgary owns Glenmore Reservoir. Number one, it's for drinking water. Two, flood, flood attenuation. And three is recreation. And it's a real challenge and, and something that we constantly work on. How do you balance all that? But drinking water is absolutely number one. 
But what we did in Glenmore is we could see with forecasts and dealing with the province, because we were very closely with their flood forecasting, uh, we knew an event was coming, not this big, but by Sunday night, once the recreational users were off the reservoir, we started to, to slowly draw down the reservoir, uh, to bring the level down, kind of drain the bathtub, uh, to make space to capture that water. So, so those of you might see, you know, it's kind of interesting, you'll see the Elbow River flow come up and you'll see the reservoir come down, but it hasn't rained yet. And, and, and that's because we're trying to get ready in advance of these events. So we had the reservoir drained as low as we could and it was waiting for the rain to fall. So on Wednesday, or on Tuesday, we were waiting and the rain came Wednesday night. The blue line is what was upstream of Glenmore Reservoir, of what came in. We had a peak flow rate of 1240 cubic meters per second. So that, you know, these aren't official numbers. Water Survey Canada still has to finalize them. Um, but that's around a 500 year return period event. What we released, what we were able to hold back was about 700 cubic meters a second, which is about a 100 year event. Um, very significant. Uh, if we, the other thing is this time lag. So the difference between this blue rise and the red rise is about six hours. And when we're looking at a matter of hours to evacuate people, buying ourselves those six hours to get everybody out was essential. Um, but the big difference when you're looking at, you know, from here to here, you're looking at approximately a two meter difference in water level. If we hadn't been able to cut that down, that could have been about two more meters of water coming through the belt line and into downtown. So huge impacts, great success story. Um, really important for, for the management of the reservoirs to be looked at. This is just to put it in context of history. So these are historical events um, dating back to the early 1900s. So this is what we saw coming out of Glemmer Reservoir, so about 700 cubic meters a second. So in here, we hadn't seen much, but it was in the 30s, it was pretty wet. If you compare it to what actually came into Glemmer Reservoir, it was around a 500 year event, so just dwarfing what we would have seen on the elbow. However, the elbow, we don't have data from the late 1800s. I'll show you the Bow River, and we do have data. Um, but you'll see that we hadn't had something like that in a long time. On the bow, I won't spend much time here, but again, flows in the 1700 cubic meters a second. To put flow into perspective, um, when I talk to a grade four classroom, I like to explain it as a dishwasher analogy. So a dishwasher is one cubic meter, roughly. So for here, the peak flow was around 1700. So take 1700 dishwashers and line them up in a line, in a wall, and 1700 dishwashers were passing a single point in the Bow River per second. And that's how much flow is coming through. And to put the bow in perspective, so this is what the bow flow was like. But if you look at history, so back in the 30s, which also was around drought time, so flooding and drought can be quite connected. Uh, we had some events, but also in the late 1800s, early 1900s, we had events uh, in this order of magnitude. So this wasn't an event that is completely unprecedented. This, this is something that we've seen, but we've had, people say, I've never seen this in my lifetime. Well, no, you haven't. It's been 80 plus years since we've seen one. Um, the other thing to note with this data is that these events tend to happen in clumps. So we're in kind of a natural cycle. We can talk about climate change if it's more frequent, but really there is a natural cycle. So although we flooded this year, we could flood again next year. We could flood in five years. It's not necessarily, when we talk about a 100 year event, it's really a probability. It has a 1% chance of occurring in any given year. It's not that it'll happen every 100 years. This is a picture of some of the, the water that we took from the river that we treat and uses drinking water. Huge success story is that the city had actually put a lot of new infrastructure into our plants and we were able to maintain quality drinking water the entire event and that is a, that's a really big deal. Um, so filthy water and I, I love that when Rachel came to talk to me about the second part of her drawing, she was so excited because she found the perfect color pen that was brown and she showed me, I'm like, yes, that's exactly it. So, um, but yeah, um, amazing just to think of the work that we did to treat that water. Uh, this is, this is a, one of our biggest erosion sites in the city that I wanted to show just to give a scale of how much change there is in the river. Um, so this on the top is before the flood and this is after. So this yellow line is where the edge of the bank was before and the purple is after. That is about 50 meters. Half a football field has eroded back. 
um, and it started to eat into a roadway and the houses were getting quite nervous because it used to be a nice big open grass park. So big, big change. Across the river you'll see a lot of gravel deposit and the river has really changed. You see a lot of these gravel deposits around. So there's a lot of work now looking at you know, what kind of impacts will I have on flooding and do, you know, do we need to look at if we have to move this gravel? It's not an easy thing to do or, or necessary unless it's going to impact something like a bridge pier or things like that. So a lot of work on that. But this is also Harvey Passage, the rapids. And you can look down here, it completely blew out a new channel and blew out those pools. So a huge amount of, of uh, force and power in the river. So this was this erosion site. You can see it eating into the river. Oh, jump forward. Um, but I love this picture because one of the things is there, we were so busy during the emergency response. Oh, it's on a timer. Um, we ran out of rock. So we actually had to start using Jersey barriers and concrete barriers to, to go in and stop the erosion. So, so I just love that they were sourcing concrete barriers from out in the parking lot. We've cleaned that up. Don't worry. It's all good now. Um, Oh, it is on a timer. This is one of the sites that was in uh, kind of a jaw-dropping moment for me. I had the fortunate, um, I was very lucky to actually go up in a helicopter a, a few times during the event. And one of the times I was up there and we were looking at the amount of damage and I had my maps in one hand and I had you know, the camera in the other and I was taking notes. And, and uh, all of a sudden we came around and we saw this is McLeod Trail here. And this is uh, the train, the C train near Earlton Station. And so this is the Elbow River. So it was, the flow is supposed to run through the roads of Earlton, but the amount of erosion that it ate away McLeod Trail and this track was just kind of dangling. And it was a moment that I kind of stopped and just realized like, wow, like in the models, you don't, you don't see the debris, you don't see the amount of erosion. You have a sense for what it would be, but to really see it uh, was quite amazing. So I'm going to finish off with just a couple slides of uh, Elbow Falls before and after. So if any of you have been out to the Elbow Falls, um, you can see these lovely pathways, these big trees, great place for a picnic, and this is after. I had a nice picnic with my kids in the gravel with a chunk of pathway that was just sitting there, but it was just amazing to see how completely different this was and the trees, just huge trees, just ripped right out. So before, after. One more, because I love that. <laughs> it's just crazy. <laughs> so I'll leave this now to Rachel. It may, when you see Twyla talking like that, it makes it even more incredible to me that she took so much time out to work with me on my little drawings, like compared to all this really serious stuff. It's really, really incredible. So talking again about this idea of before and after and just this, this whole notion of a river never ever being the same thing and to be even be able to draw it or take a photograph of it, you are freezing something in time and space which is completely dynamic and infinitely moving. I was very conscious of that when I was, was doing my drawing but the flood event really does make you realise even more so how, how much a river is constantly changing its banks and moving around but this of course just speeded that whole process up and exaggerated it so that it completely shifted and completely eroded and this was just one of the photographs that I took just for my own research purposes so that when I was walking around originally I could get a sense of the distances between the different bridge piers when I was plotting out how I would put them out but when I revisited the same area um, thinking that I would redraw the river and just see where the water went after the flood um, I was seeing things such as where once there were four bridge piers in the water, now there's six. And I realised quite quickly that I would have to completely redraw a new flow to represent <coughs> where the peak flow of the flood was. I mean, another thing that people quite often ask me is, are you going to draw another layer which says where it is now? Um, but that would make it an extremely complicated drawing and I would have to probably stay here for another a few months to do that. But you would have to draw it every single day forever to try and capture the way it's constantly moving. Um, but I did, I decided to draw, redraw right over the top uh, in a different colour, in this flood brown colour. Um, and so I could do quite a lot by um, looking at all the aerial photographs I got, also working very closely with Twyla, who was brilliant to give me all the, all the information I needed in terms of the flood line 
And then you can start thinking about, I began to understand a lot more because I was getting information about the depths of the river at certain places. Um, the floodway and the flood fringe and how that works in terms of this particular part of the landscape. Um, but something I really did need a lot of help with was working out exactly what happened during the event within the Bronny Brook wastewater treatment facility because that became kind of headline news and also so much of this particular area became inundated that one of the bridge piers that I had originally drawn was, was the one that derailed the train. Um, and then he had all this area um, flooded and then whatever happened with um, <coughs> Bonnybrook. So I ended up going back to Bonnybrook and kind of settled myself in there and turned one of their spare offices into a studio and spent a lot of time with the staff who were amazing. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about what happened during the event and they were very open and they just told me everything they could remember and we got, I got, we got talking. Uh, I ended up in the same way I had recorded the voices, which I hadn't mentioned before in this talk, so this won't make sense. Um, I'd started recording conversations because I had realised that the conversations I was having with people were really an essential part of the work, and to keep those hidden from the people looking at the drawings wasn't really making sense to me, and so I started to use recording of the conversations I was having um, as another layer with which I could which I could present people with when they were looking at the work. That's a, re that's a really long sentence. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it to be so long. Um, so I was talking to the staff at Bybrook and we all would gather around these drawings and they would describe to me how they remembered the flood event. I was talking to people, the maintenance crew, who were underneath the tunnels when the water would come through and they had pretty much had to run for their lives to get out as the water started coming in the underground tunnels. Um, a lot of the admin staff, a lot of the senior uh, staff as well were really open in describing to me exactly what happened as the water started coming in um, and they were retreating back, getting sandbags out, trying to do whatever they could to, to save the facility. Um, so all the drawing that I did on that second layer is really just derived from conversations and I ended up editing a lot of those conversations and they're, they're available for people to listen to because some of the stories and just, this, just listening to the voices uh, as we talk together reveals so much more than the drawing ever could about um, how people reacted, what they saw, how they felt, where the water went. Um, but I'm, I'm really pleased with, with, all those, with, with being able to speak to those people. And I think that in a way, for me anyway, that, that's the work that I've made, is the conversations that I've had and the friends that I've made, as much as these finished drawings, which is really only half the story for me. Um, so that's a detail of, of one of the drawings you can see over there, um, with the flood layer over the top. Um, oh yeah, so finally, I suppose, just to, almost to finish on, this is the inside of the cruise shack, which is outside the water centre. I don't know if you saw it, but... The guys here were fantastic when I needed a space to make this big long drawing in. Um, there was a, a crew shack which the maintenance guys would normally use at some location somewhere uh, and hang out at. Um, we, uh, we got hold of one and they fitted it out especially and kind of turned it into a, a studio and it turns out to be the most perfect space. I really love it in there. Um, <laughs> there's even a grill, there's a little uh, cooker. Um, there's a mirror, they must be quite vain, the, um, <laughs> the crew guys, because there's mirrors in there. Um, and it's really hot, it's really warm, there's a massive heater. Um, and everybody was always worried that I would get cold when it got really um, cold here, but it's actually the most hottest building I've ever been in. <laughs> it's really cosy. Um, uh, so I really enjoyed it. And the thing that's really exciting about this is being able to be the first artist, I got to set lots of things up and be the guinea pig for everyone else <laughs> who's, who's going to be coming after me. And I've really enjoyed that part of it, but I'm really excited to think that I'm going to leave this place and other artists will come in after me and do something completely different. Their work will be so different from mine, um, and they might take this cruise shack to a completely different part of the city, meet completely different people, look at something in a completely different way. And I think Watershed Plus is so incredible for allowing every single artist who comes here to do something completely different and to interact in completely different ways. And there's so much freedom and so much sharing of knowledge. It's absolutely astounding and overwhelming. And I don't think 
I will realise how lucky I've been to be here until I've gone home and sat on my own in a dark room and started crying <laughs> that I'm not here anymore. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to finish with this because apart from being embedded with all these incredible staff and, and learning all this incredible stuff about the water system, I've also done stuff um, outside of this by being integrated into the artistic community here. I've met some incredible artists. Um, and I got to be part of a show which was curated by Yvonne just sitting there and I was so proud to be part of that. She um, has brought together some Glasgow artists and some Calgary artists and the Calgary artists are fantastic. Some of them are my, have now become my very good friends and they are wonderful people and they make wonderful work. And this show called We is now going to be going to Ed Edmonton where um, we will be put together. There's, it's a group show with Calgary artists and uh, Glasgow-based artists in the same room, and I'm incredibly privileged to be part of that as well. Um, and I just wanted to finish on this slide because I know I've been talking all night about myself, but it's really about me uh, and the people that I've made friends with, my really good friends that I've made here, and the work that I've made together with people and collaborated with and um, all the friends that I've made. I'm just very happy and very sad to say goodbye to you all. Okay, that's it. <laughs>